Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you in peace. Amen. You know, we've been reading this story for three weeks now, four weeks. And I think there's so much there. And sometimes I wonder what was in Peter's head that caused him to even think about getting out of the water, getting out of the boat and walking on the water. What do you think it was working in him or not working with him to kind of put one step and then the next, get out of the boat, walk on the water toward Jesus, defying the laws of gravity and human nature? I mean, I know that you can do incredible things when you have amazing amount of adrenaline pumping through your system, but what was it about Peter that caused him to want to walk on the water? Was it his faith? Or was it his foolish impulsiveness? What, what do you think? I mean, was it his, his commitment to Jesus and that he could do what he was being called to do? Or do you think it was just his impulsivity? Now, if you know the story of Peter in the Bible, he was an incredibly impulsive disciple. If Peter were your child, he would have driven you nuts Mom, is that stove hot really? I'll bet I can run three times across the street before the traffic comes. You know, jumping off cliffs. I mean, there's all kinds of things that that um, I can kind of identify with some of those. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things about Peter that would have driven you crazy as a parent because Peter was incredibly impulsive. Remember how on the Mount of Transfiguration they or up there with Jesus after he'd been praying, and a mighty <clears throat> light overshadowed Jesus, and Peter, James, and John didn't know what to think, and, and Peter says, hey, Jesus, this is really cool. Remember, let's build three booths and stay up here, and Jesus chastised his impulsiveness and get, get behind me, Satan. On a road to Caesarea Philippi, after Jesus had been confessed by Peter as the living Lord and Savior, um, Peter said, Jesus told him that that would mean his suffering and death, and Peter said, Lord, this will never happen to you. And again, in that impulsiveness, Jesus chastised him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when the disciples were there with Jesus praying, the guards came to take Jesus away. Peter takes his sword, and whacks off the ears of Melchus. Remember the, the soldier, he was there. Jesus got some duct tape, took this ear, put it back on the slave and, and healed it. Um, what was it about Peter's impulsivity, his foolish impulsivity that caused him to do that? And was that the same foolish impulsivity that caused Peter to want to get out of the boat on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in the midst of that storm. You know, maybe I'm giving Peter too much of the benefit of the doubt, but I don't think it was his foolish impulsivity in the boat when he cried out to Jesus, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Notice that sentence, if it's you, command me to come out on the water to you. In some ways, this is not just Peter's impulsivity of just, whoa, let's just say the next thing that comes to our head. Instead, Peter's asking two things. He's asking Jesus, number one, to confirm his identity. So if it's you, if it's you, if he were only impulsive and seen somebody walking on water, he would have just jumped out and walked. But Peter says, if it's you, and then he says, if it's you, sorry, it's that back to school book that has joy in me a little bit. If it's you, bid me to command, you command me to walk on the water to you. If it's you, confirming his identity and then asking Jesus to command him to walk on the water toward Jesus. Now, notice that Peter doesn't say, wow, that's really cool. I'd like to do that. Jump out of the boat and try to walk by himself. He didn't say, 
Dear Jesus, I'd, I'd love to do that. Wouldn't that be a great show? I could make a little money on the side by walking on the water. I mean, you know the joke about the stones and the pastor fishing and all that stuff. But he says, Jesus, if it's you, once he confirms his identity, you command me to walk on the water to you. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on water, and came to Jesus. He knew <clears throat> that it was Jesus who was commanding him to walk on the water. He knew his identity. He knew it was Jesus' command, and he walked to Jesus on the water. If you want to walk on the water, you have to get out of the boat. That's what we've been talking about these last couple of weeks. Because Peter didn't want to stay in the boat with the other 11 boat disciples, boat potatoes, and just kind of sit there and watch life go by. Instead, he asked Jesus, command me, once it's you, and I will come walk to you on the water. What I'd like to suggest this morning, about a year and a half ago I used this sentence, that if, if, if we do what only we can do, then God does what only God can do. If we do what only we can do, then God will do what only God can do. Because Peter didn't walk on the water by himself. Walking on the water was beyond his capacity. But rather than acting foolishly impulsive, Peter confirmed that it was Jesus asking him to come and walk on the water. So he got out of the boat, and walked on the water toward Jesus. There's a life lesson to be learned there. If we do what only we can do, then God will do what only God can do. <clears throat> now I want to tell you a story, another story in the Bible that tells the same lesson. In fact, this, this same kind of lesson about putting your foot in the water or stepping out is a common story in the Bible of people doing what only they can do and then God doing what only God can do. It's a story in the book of Joshua. Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Joshua judges Ruth. By the time of the book of Joshua, the sixth book in the Bible, the people of Israel were still wandering in the Bible, wandering in the wilderness. They had been through the captivity, they had been through the Red Sea with Moses. They had been wandering in the wilderness where God gave them the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And they took those two tablets of stone, put them in a great big box, and called it the Ark of the Covenant. Because it was the Ark, the, the, the covenant, the promise that God made to the people. And so they carried around them with a great big box called the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, by the end of their wilderness wanderings, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses had died, and the only two people who were left who originally crossed the Red Sea were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua became the leader uh, after Moses. Now, they're still wandering in the wilderness at the beginning of the book of Joshua, on their way to the Promised Land, they're on one side of the Jordan River. The Promised Land lay on the other side of the river. Now, the problem with the people of Israel being on the one side of the river with the Promised Land on the other is that they knew that there were uh, 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 groups of people, clans of people, seven of them, as a matter of fact, occupying the Promised Land and each one of those people had an army that was much larger than even the people of Israel. And the people of Israel, they didn't have an army. They were a ragtag group of farmers and wives and children. They had been in captivity. They had been in the wilderness. They didn't have an army to go across the river, much less fight with seven groups that were currently occupying the Promised Land. But God had told Joshua, like God told Peter, to come, to come. So Joshua chapter 1 is a time that's very similar to Peter walking on the water. In Joshua 3, people of Israel came to the banks of the Jordan River, and it was springtime. 
The banks of the river were overflowing because it was flood stage. Normally, the River Jordan is about 100 feet wide and 20 feet deep, but at flood stage, it swelled and the banks were overrunning. Even today, a modern army would take quite some time to, to build a bridge and cross it, but for this ragtag group of people of Israel, it was nearly impossible. <clears throat> I'm not going to shake hands afterwards, I'll just say hello to you. <laughs> just to let you know. God said to this ragtag group of people from Israel, no army, promised land lying on the other side with seven armies, each of them larger than the people of Israel. God says, dudes, I want you to take the priests. I want you to take the priests and they're to go in front of you and carry the Ark of the Covenant out front. I want them to lead the way. I want them to go to the, and this is the flood stage river. I want you to go to the edge of the water, put your foot in, and trust me for a miracle. God didn't give them any clue as to how God was going to do it. God simply said to them, like God said to Peter, come. And the Bible says the priests took the Ark of the Covenant in Joshua chapter 3, containing the Ten Commandments. The whole nation of Israel began to follow them, gather at the banks of the Jordan River, and listen to these words from Joshua 3.15. As soon as the priests stepped into the river, the water kept stopped flowing. As it piled up, as it stopped flowing, the waters began to subside below, and eventually it was dry. The priests started walking across. They stopped in the middle, holding the Ark of the Covenant, and all of the people of Israel walked by. It was the second crossing of a massive river for deliverance for the people of Israel. But it started when they literally stepped out in faith. And when they stepped out in faith, when they got their feet wet, amazing things started to happen. You know, there's, there's other stories in the Bible just like that. Peter stepped out and got his feet wet. People of Israel stepped out and got his feet wet. Many, many chances are given in the Old Testament for people to do what only they could do because then when we do what we can do, then God does what only God can do. And it's often the case, I think, that that first step is the hardest. The first, remember you, when you were first started to ride, when your mom or dad was holding on and kind of let you go, remember that, that exhilaration, just that, that first step is oftentimes the hardest. What, if the priests would have made fools of themselves stepping into the River Jordan and nothing would have happened? What if Peter would have sunk like a rock to the bottom of the sea? What's the stormy sea that you don't want to walk on? What's the River Jordan that, that you're fearful of putting your feet into for the first time? What's the barrier that's keeping you from taking that step to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ? What's that, what's that boat of safety that you want to stay in and don't want to let go of? What's the bank? that's keeping you from wandering into the promised land. You know, there's a verse from the end of Joshua that you probably know that describes his faith and commitment. And at the end of Joshua, at the end of his life, Joshua is the one who said, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Choose this day who you're going to serve. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's a choice. It's a commitment. Choose this day which, who you're going to serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, how do you, how do you serve the Lord? Well, one way to suggest that is on your way out of worship today, um, be sure to pick up our fall 2013 opportunities at Zion. <coughs> 40 eight or so different ways to serve the Lord from ministry team to fellowship groups to service opportunities. Pick one of these up, updated since last year. 
take a step, another step to getting your feet wet in serving the Lord, both at Zion and within the community. If your passion is working with kids, we have Sunday school, vacation Bible school, the weekend backpack program. If your passion is in serving, Jericho Table is right here, right, available for you to serve in that way. If your passion is working with a group of guys, we have a fellowship group, we have the green team that Glenn is always welcoming more people to work with. Lend a hand, there's lots of different ways for guys to be involved. Fellowship, women's groups, worship, many of opportunities for that. Adventure, we went kayaking three times last summer. I'm hoping if there's some folks who like the snowshoe, I'd love to get out snowshoeing with some folks this winter. Many different opportunities, and on the back side is a list of people, a list of areas that people at Zion are involved in the community. Just take a look through there and take that step. Like Peter, take that step, that next step to be involved in many ways in which we here are involved both at church and the community. Stay in God's Word. Worship Him always. Step out in faith because if you want to walk on water you do need to get out of the boat in jesus name amen then let's stand